Um, well, comrades, I'm going to try and keep my remarks as, as brief as I can, um, because I think after that very moving, very powerful uh, film, and after that incredibly powerful uh, personal eyewitness testimony, um, I think comrades will no doubt want to mull over all those ideas. Um, what I've decided to do actually is just concentrate on just one aspect um, of the original notes I wanted to, um, to concentrate on really, which was to look at something which is a bit of a blind spot as far as the British Labour movement is concerned in terms of um, Zionism and that is its relationship with imperialism and especially British imperialism because uh, almost throughout its entire history since the 19th century Zionism has ridden on the coattails of one imperialist power or another. In the early days it was very much directed towards an alliance with the British Empire. Uh, these days of course it's more directed towards the, uh, an alliance with the United States. But even as far back as um, 1903 uh, there were discussions between uh, Britain and uh, Theodore Herzl's Zionist organisation uh, where the Zionists were offered 5,000 square miles of Kenya uh, in order to settle. And there was a, a serious discussion about settling uh, Jewish colonial settlers in uh, Kenya. It was actually called the Uganda Project because the territory had once been part of uh, Uganda. But that was actually one of the serious concepts that the British had at the time in Africa uh, of settling European Jewish settlers as a kind of buffer between the colonial administration and, and the, uh, the native population. Um, one of the biggest uh, moments of um, Jewish migration in the, the, the 20th century was just before the First World War, when around a million uh, or a million and a half Jewish people left Tsarist Russia and Poland um, as a result of the pogroms there, as, as, as a result of repression. And it's an amazing fact, but only about 4% of those a million or so uh, Jewish people actually went to Palestine. Uh, the, the Zionist project was so unattractive that more than 95% of Jews escaping oppression and anti-Semitism <coughs> and pogroms chose rather to live in countries like Britain or France, and certainly you know, the United States, New York was a particular destination. So it's a great myth that Zionism was the natural answer to anti-Semitism. This is a, a myth that's been put forward still to this day. Um, certainly in, those, in that period, Zionism was not seen as a, a legitimate answer. It was really the events of the 1914-18 war which really changed this. Because when the war broke out in 1914, which we're, you know, an anniversary we're uh, marking this, this year, the centenary of it, um, Lenin's definition of the First World War as a robber's war, a predatory war, a war to carve up empires and colonies has never been more accurate than when you look at what happened in the Middle East. Uh, not just what happened in, in Palestine, but Iraq, uh, <coughs> Syria, Lebanon, and all of these countries were uh, taken from the Ottoman Empire and literally carved up between the British and French. Uh, an agreement was reached in 1916, the infamous uh, Sykes-Picot Agreement, where literally two civil servants, from one from each side, sat down with a map and with a pen and a ruler, they, they actually literally uh, decided where uh, the boundaries of, of these new states and these new possessions were going to be. Um, and the Zionist movement saw its opportunity there. Um, one of the British cabinet ministers, Herbert Samuel, um, just two months after the outbreak of war between uh, Britain and the Ottoman Empire, uh, circulated a, a memorandum called the, on the, called the Future of Palestine, which he circulated to the other cabinet ministers. And in it he said, I'm assured that the solution of the problem of Palestine, which would be much the most welcome to the leaders and supporters of the Zionist movement throughout the world, would be the annexation of the country to the British Empire. So the Zionists actually quite literally wanted to be the foot soldiers of the British Empire and, and to be the, 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 uh, the colonists in the Middle East. Uh, then of course you have the Balfour Declaration which was made in 1917 uh, promising a, a Jewish home in Palestine. Um, Twenty years later uh, Lloyd George was being interviewed by a parliamentary commission 
and he admitted that, and he'd been Prime Minister at the time of the Balfour Declaration, and he, he said to the, um, the Commission that the Declaration was made uh, for propagandist reasons, because at that point, 1917 was a kind of turning point for the, uh, the, the Anglo-French-Russian alliance, obviously 1917 was the Russian Revolution, and there was an attempt here to win over um, world, uh, the world Jewish community, and particularly in the United States, to a position of support for, for Britain's war effort and France's war effort. And of course, 1917 was when the United States actually did enter the war. So it was a quite cynical ploy, in fact, which had as much to do with winning uh, another, imperial, uh, uh, another imperialist ally as it had to do with any promise to, uh, to the Jewish people for, for self-determination. Um, after the war, the British double-crossed the French more than once. There had to be a new agreement. The Sykes-Picot agreement didn't actually hold exactly. Um, Britain already established a mandate in Palestine even before they'd been given the mandate, supposedly, by the League of Nations. They actually already established a military uh, occupation. They appointed the High Commissioner all in advance of having um, a mandate from uh, the League of Nations. Um, the mandate actually included what is now Jordan, and the British split Palestine uh, from Transjordan, which they created and set up as, a, as essentially a puppet state. They brought in one of the uh, Hashemite uh, chieftains, uh, Saudi Arabian clan, and imposed him. His name was Abdullah, and he's the grandfather of the, the, the current king, I think, uh, and imposed this Hashemite dynasty on, on Jordan to create a, a pro-British state on the banks of the Jordan and they imposed his brother uh, as the king of Iraq although he didn't last uh, as long as the, uh, the Jordanians did. So all throughout this period the British were quite deliberately, quite consciously involved in both the, um, uh, the, uh, the division of the, of the region and the promotion of Zionist interests in the, in the region. Um, interestingly enough uh, the, the, uh, the Zionist leader David Ben-Gurion, who became the first leader of Israel after 1948, um, said during discussions in the 1930s that um, the acceptance of partition does not commit us to renounce Transjordan. One does not demand from anybody to give up his vision. We shall accept a state in the boundaries fixed today, but the boundaries of Zionist aspirations are the concern of the Jewish people, and no external factor will limit them. So even before uh, 1948, this, this was a discussion about partition plan in, the 19, in 1937, uh, already uh, the Zionists were quite clear that whatever partition plan was going to come up uh, was not something that they were particularly going to, um, to abide by. Um, if we fast forward to the actual eve of partition, many people believe, I think, that the creation of the State of Israel has some kind of connection to the Holocaust and there's enormous sympathy for the victims of the Holocaust and the idea that well there was nowhere else for, for the Jewish people to go and that it was quite natural that they should have their home in, uh, in Israel. Um, but the facts are that um, in 1958, despite, uh, 1948, despite uh, enormous efforts by things like the Jewish National Fund and donations from Jewish communities elsewhere to buy up land from absentee landlords and then to expel the Palestinian um, tenants of that land. Uh, in 1948, less than 6% of the land of Palestine was actually under uh, Jewish ownership. And the Palestinian population, the Palestinian Arab population, Christian and Muslim, uh, represented still about 65% of the total population. That was down from about 90% at the time of the mandate in 1920. So even with the influx of the uh, refugees from the Holocaust and from, from Europe, uh, the, the Jewish population was still a minority within Palestine as a whole. And the initial partition plan was quite different from the one that uh, ended up uh, happening. The initial plan was to divide Palestine into three parts. The Palestinian state was to have 42% of the territory and it was to have a population of about 820,000 Palestinians um, and that state would also include around 10,000 Jews. The Jewish state 
which was to have 56% of the Palestinian territory, had just under 500,000 Jews, but it also had nearly 440,000 Palestinians within this um, Jewish state. And Jerusalem was meant to be shared, it was meant to be given an international status because the populations were, were relatively balanced. So it was to have a, a slightly different status from both the, um, um, <coughs> the Jewish and the, the Palestinian state. But it was quite clear that if you look at the figures for the, the Jewish state, half a million, half a million Jewish people, 440,000 Palestinians, that would have en uh, enabled a Palestinian majority to have been built up uh, within a, a generation or two just through natural population growth. So <clears throat> it was pretty inevitable that the Zionists would look towards what they, they called transfer, which was the euphemism they, they had for, for ethnically cleansing the Palestinian people. Um, <coughs> just a One of the key Zionist leaders, uh, um, uh, an advisor to Ben-Gurion, Yosef Weitz wrote, transfer does not serve only one aim to reduce the Arab population. It also serves a second purpose, by no means less important, which is to evict land now cultivated by Arabs and to free it for Jewish settlement. The only solution is to transfer the Arabs from here to neighbouring countries. Not a single village or a single tribe must be let off. <coughs> That's interesting for two reasons. Firstly, because it's, a, it's an open statement of ethnic cleansing, and this is long before 1948. Secondly, it's a, a de facto recognition that um, the Palestinians were cultivating the soil, that they were landowners and that they were working the land. The, the, the myth that the, the Palestinians had let the land go to rack and ruin. It was only when the Jews arrived and the Zionist settlements had started that the, the desert began to bloom. This is one of the great myths and clearly it was clearly not true. <coughs> the, um, the Israeli historian Ilan Pape has actually dated the point at which the Zionist leadership decided to go for ethnic cleansing. Uh, they called it uh, Plan Dalet. It was Plan D. There were various stages of um, uh, strategies that they had. But the, what they went for was, was Plan Dalet. And he, he estimates that that actually was decided on the 10th of March 1948. And within six months, um, Zionist militias had expelled or forced out around about 800,000 Palestinians. Um, 531 villages were destroyed and 11 towns were emptied. So what we saw there, <clears throat> what we saw there from Gaza happened time and time again in individual cities and parts all across um, Palestine at that time. There's also um, a myth that um, <clears throat> the partition failed because the, the Palestinians were the ones, the Arabs were the ones who rejected uh, pal um, partition, and this was a sensible solution. And it's true the Palestinians quite naturally rejected it, as you can see by the demographic um, figures I gave. Uh, they had no reason to give up 56% of their land when they made up 65% of, of the population. It's quite a, a legitimate op uh, opposition. But um, not only was there a view within the Zionist leadership around Ben-Gurion that partition is something that they weren't going to particularly abide by. On the other side of the, the Zionist split, um, Menachem Begin, who later became Prime Minister of Israel and the founder of the Likud party, and who was one of the, the leaders of the Argun and the so-called revisionist Zionists, which were opposed to Ben-Gurion's groups, um, he said in 1948, at the time of the partition, the partition of the homeland is illegal. It will never be recognised. The signature institutions and individuals of the partition agreement is invalid. It will not bind the Jewish people. Jerusalem was and will be forever our capital. Eretz Israel will be restored to the people of Israel. All of it and forever. Um, I, th I think that's quite clear where the origins of the conflict uh, come from. I'm not going to go into the periods after 1948 because there's so many um, areas to, um, uh, to talk about. But it's worth recalling that it's not just pa uh, Palestine that's occupied, that the Israelis continue to occupy the Golan Heights, which is Syrian, the Shaba Farm area, which is Lebanese. And 
there is no end to the designs of the expansionist elements within uh, Israel. And I think the democratic and progressive forces in Israel, which we were talking about earlier on, have an enormous uphill struggle to, uh, to resist this because there has been a definite shift, I think, to the right in Israeli politics over the past 30, 40 years. Um, Menachem Begin was regarded as an outcast in 48, 49. His groups were really regarded as the, the kind of lunatic fringe. But by the mid-70s, um, Likud was beginning to become the dominant political party as it's effectively remained ever since. So there's been a real shift, very um, a negative shift within Israeli politics. And the divisions within the Palestinian camp have obviously also had their own negative um, factors as well. And as was being said earlier, the hope, hopeful sign is that the, these divisions could be um, overcome, at least in some way. Um, but I think we also have to look at the conflict now in a much wider um, uh, perspective. Because what we're seeing is that the the old world order, the order that was established in 1920, the Sykes-Picot uh, agreements, the Anglo-French uh, agreements, the division of Iraq, the division of Syria, Lebanon, and so on, somehow seem to be, be unravelling. And speaking to um, Theresa just before the meeting, we, we, you mentioned the fact that um, the Egyptian government, the, the new government, the Sisi government, has now gone back to the position of enforcing the blockade. I mean, Egypt could stop the blockade pretty much tomorrow. Uh, if it chose to. Uh, it would completely alter the balance of forces within the Middle East. So there's also a struggle here that goes beyond um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to a wider struggle for democracy and, and freedom and for anti-imperialist politics within, within the Middle East. Um, I'm going to kind of leave it there because, as I said, I wanted to cut everything short. I know it's been a long evening, but I think it's been a very, very worthwhile one. And um, if there are any questions, I can I can take them. But otherwise, I just wanted to make that link. I think Zionism and imperialism that's a it's an almost unbreakable link. If we can begin to focus on on breaking that link, then we'll do as much as we possibly can to aid uh, the Palestinians in their struggle for freedom. Thanks, Kenny. Any questions for Kenny or contributions? There has been an attempt parallel with the process of, of enormous acts of solidarity with the Palestinian people. There's also been a couple of quite large, well, relatively large manifestations in, in London trying to equate the sort of anti Zionism with anti Semitism and, you know, focusing on the fact that. Um, there's been a sort of an alleged meteoric rise of, in the, the number of anti-Semitic incidents in France and various parts of Europe and so on and so forth. And, and psychologically, that is actually quite a, a difficult sort of barrier for, for, the, for the, the, the sort of pro-Palestinian, anti-imperialist end, end of things to, 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 to break through. Because there is still a huge amount of that's a sort of groundswell of, of if, you, if you will, of, of people who, who, while they support the Palestinians, they don't want to do anything which could be even remotely construed as being anti-Semitic and all the rest of it. And, you know, the, the existence within our own trade union movement of an organisation called Trade Union Friends of Israel is nothing short of absolutely you know, scandalous and absolutely disgraceful mm -hmm. that anybody could stand on a platform to support the state of Israel in, in the current climate. Um, and I'm just wondering, what, what is your sense of it? Because at the moment, for as long as, as the state of Israel continues to play the role that it, it, it does in foreign policy terms, in terms of, you know, it's, it's US imperialism's cat sport has been described as in, in years gone by, and that, that's a very apt description. For as long as it, it has the backing of United States imperialism and, and the main centres of imperialism, and for as long as the you know, venal and utterly corrupt um, regimes in the Arab world, which when, when the United States actually lectures the, the world on, on, on about the importance of democracy and freedom and so on and so forth, you know, it studiously avoids talking about um, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and Qatar 
and now now that Morsi has, has, has gone, thank goodness he's gone, you know, they, they've got something like what, what they had before, which is an utterly corrupt, profoundly reactionary military regime now. They're, so they're, for as long as these, these thing conditions apply, there appears to be, it appears to be a sort of an intractable problem. So I'm just wondering, from a political perspective, what, what do you think are the, are the, the sort of the, the, the kind of practicalities of solidarity and beyond supporting the, the general question of the boycott and everything? What other practical things do you think people who wish to show, or organisations that wish to show solidarity with the Palestinian people at this time, what could they actually do? What should they be doing? Any further questions? Johnny? Um, I, I noticed like, there was a statistic, I think it was BBC News, it was saying uh, for the support for Hamas just after um, the sort of latest attack, I think it was up to, if they called an election, it would be 65% um, win. And I, 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 I don't know too much about it, but I heard sort of interesting discussions like, uh, in the World Service and stuff like that, folks saying, well, it's Hamas are in a difficult position, they don't really want to govern <coughs> Gaza, they don't really want to consider themselves a military uh, and a paramilitary organisation, just uh, any background on Hamas, or you know, sort of what they're saying, or their plans for the sort of media uh, future, uh, or how, how they, they see it being resolved in any sense. That's a very big question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any further questions? Any further questions? Any further questions? Any further I think when the <coughs> I think that the um, the boycott campaign is definitely working. Um, I mean, there's one one of the Israeli newspapers Haaretz is is online in English, and uh, if you read that every day, you'll see there's boycott stories each each and every day somewhere in the world, and this is being mentioned. So it has an enormous psychological effect, um, which is exactly what everybody can do in a sense. You know, the, the boycott of um, the um, uh, the, the festival, the Edinburgh Festival of the uh, Israeli Arts Group. Uh, these things get enormous coverage, and they're very. Um, it doesn't take you know a, a mass movement of fifty, hundred thousand people to do that. It just takes a, a very determined, very focused uh, campaign. Um, but the Israeli newspapers are covering all this, so this is filtering in. And I mean, it's at the moment, yes, it's. Uh, it's being presented in a way which is oh, that's the old, you know, the old anti-Semitism again. Um, but Israel has got away with things. It has had impunity. You were making this point earlier. It has had impunity. It could have done just about any war crime uh, within the the occupied territories over the past decade and, and got away with it. So the fact that people are taking sanctions, they're not waiting for governments to impose you know, South African style sanctions. Uh, but the fact that these um, the, the BDS movement has kind of taken off in the way that it has, I think psychologically is phenomenally important. Um, and I also think that there's that there has been a tipping point on this particular attack. I think the outrage. I mean, it's difficult for me to gauge it in terms of Britain because I'm not here. But um, I think there's been an outrage about the scale, the you know, the disproportionality, which is a, a horrible word to use when you're talking about the the kind of levels of atrocities. Um, and I think Israel's moral authority, which was always a, a myth, I think that has slipped um, quite definitely. So I think there's now, um, I think more people are aware of these links with what's going on in the Middle East, um, that uh, what Israel is doing is not only wrong, it's dangerous, it's dangerous for the whole planet, it's not something that's confined to just you know, Palestinian villages or, or what have you. So I think that the um, you know, the, the BDS movement in general, and especially very targeted um, campaigns, I think that is definitely um, having an effect already. Um, I can't really answer your question with that one, Hamas, because I don't know enough. Maybe, maybe Theresa yeah. will say something. But. I mean, Hamas were extremely unpopular in Gaza when I was there in 2008. I they don't make that great governors, <laughs> but uh, in general, they weren't very popular, and people reckoned that they were, they were elected in because Fatah were so corrupt. You know, people were seeing the money going, just disappearing, that was coming in, that wasn't going into the communities. And Fatah had also made alliances, rather than challenging the, the criminal families and the, the 
particularly strong criminal groups, but I had made alliances with them, where uh, so uh, people were feeling very insecure. Um, so after Hamas were elected, to begin with, they were very, very popular because they clamped down on the criminals, they brought security and brought safety for people. Um, and then they basically made themselves, they, they were growing in unpopularity because they were just imposing to try and, uh, to try and keep their, their more radical side wings on it. You know, in line, they were bringing in slightly more oppressive laws and things. And they were making it was particularly among the youth, they become very unpopular. Since this uh, uh, Islamic Jihad had been getting much, much bigger. Uh, and part of that, and again, it was reported in Haaretz, uh, and in several, um, several studies within Israel, there were reports about how, as the governing body in Gaza, Hamas were actually implementing Israeli policy on behalf of the Israelis. They were keeping under control the more radical ones that were preventing missile fire from Gaza. Um, although the propaganda is that Hamas had been firing all these rockets, it was actually recognised within the Israeli think tanks that actually Hamas were preventing the radical ones from firing rockets. Um, it was only after major attacks, uh, it happened after three um, people being kidnapped that Hamas fired off some rockets. Um, and they were making, like when I, when I was there in the three months after the last ceasefire, there was 87 Palestinians shot in the buffer zone, just wandering about. Uh, there were the fishermen were coming under intense pressure. There was 11 people who had been shot dead. And there was a lot of pressure from the community to hit back. It was like, why, why, why should we sit here and allow ourselves to be hit and not hit back, not respond, not retaliate? Um, but Hamas were very, very strictly actually imposing a slightly larger zone where they weren't allowing people into. They were imposing an extra zone in the sea. And they actually confiscated one of the fishing boats, not because they'd gone over the limit that the Israelis had imposed, but they'd gone too close to it. And that, and the boat had come in all shot up. And the government said, look, you must have provoked the Israelis for taking the boat off you. Um, and actually confiscated that fishing boat because they were desperately trying to be see to not be seen as provoking violence out of the Israelis. And the pressure that was building up to actually hit back at the Israelis. Hamash knew that anybody hitting back, anybody firing rockets was going to cause the attack to happen to begin again. And they they weren't ready, they weren't in a position to, to give any sort of defence to the population or to so they were they were like, for instance, when we were out in the fields farming um, on the first day, where people came out to watch, because it was kind of novelty, people were, were farming that bit closer to the fence, you know, closer to the to the limit that they were allowed to, to farm, supposedly allowed to farm. The Hamas police came out to make, take everybody who was just watching away, because they knew that a crowd building up was liable to uh, bring fire, gunfire on. And we still we still ended up having to leave the field because we were being shot at, the Israeli shot the tractor up. Um, but the Hamas police were doing their utmost to keep people away from the fence. So they were losing a lot of popularity because they were actually being seen as imposing the Israeli policies in Gaza and actually doing the policing on behalf of the Israelis. You see it in the West Bank as well. Fatah have lost a lot of popularity because their police step in and prevent the crowds from getting to the fence to do the, the, the demonstration they want to do because they're trying to 
prevent that spark, mm. prevent that provocation. And um, so yeah, being in power doesn't make you popular <laughs> in Palestine. But um, but now Hamas are definitely much more popular again in Hamas in Gaza because they were seen as as having fought back this time. Um, but all of all of the different organisations worked together. Uh, and the unity I noticed that there was Fatah and Hamas flags flying together in the crowds that were celebrating the ceasefire and that was something you just wouldn't have seen a year ago, two years ago, because they were so antagonistic towards one another. Um, again, you know, Islamic jihad flags and most and, and they were all flying together, which it must have been a very scary sight for the Israelis, actually. Uh, but hopefully that political unity will, will actually bring some sort of resolution for the Palestinians. Uh, I don't know if that answers. Any last questions, comments? Well, <coughs> one of the things that uh, surprised me, I mean, uh, we haven't really talked about America. Well, we have, we have. I mean, the, the whole American support of, of Israel, which obviously is so crucial uh, for the Israelis. Uh, and I always assumed it was um, kind of, you know, a big Jewish lobby and, you know, just, you know people who were powerful and whatever in business and media and what have you. Um, but there's actually, that's not the, 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 the biggest support by any means. There's a huge Christian element there which is um, based on this, you know, really quite exotic theology where uh, Israel is sent, you know, the, the, the state of Israel is centered to everything and, you know, they, they, they have this really kind of bizarre interpretation of, of uh, biblical texts. And so they see this as key. And I can't remember who the guy was, but one of the people who was involved in... Uh, basically creating the, the, the Israeli state, the Zionist state, was somebody of that disposition who thought uh, this will fulfill prophecy and so on. Um, and it's just uh, it's just quite incredible that it's it's not necessarily the Jewish uh, people in America, but, but a very, very right-wing fundamentalist Christian group. Um, that, that's very, very powerful. You know, and, and they, they um, I don't know how on earth I'm on their... <laughs> On their emails, and I get these bizarre emails, and uh, where they, where you can buy all these, um, you know, prayer shawls and all this, you know, for Christians, you know, but it's all Jewish. Stuff. It's it's really quite bizarre. But uh, I mean, how how do you? I mean, for example, the stuff we were saying in that in, in, in that video. How how do how do we how do we transmit that to, to to that kind of people and say like whatever your theology, whatever your whatever. You know, these are human beings who are suffering. Can you not see that? You know, how how do we how do we transmit that to, to people? Give me a video, then. Can you circulate it? Put it around in the web. Yeah. Can I just ask kind of a question? I mean, a lot of the talk when you're talking about the not you personally, but people generally, when you talk about the Palestinian political process, it's always couched in terms of Hamas and Fatah and what have you. But the Palestinian national movement is not some kind of vast, undifferentiated mass. There is a sort of religious element to it in the Palestinian national movement. There's also uh, a secular trend within the Palestinian national movement. You know, for example, the Palestinian People's Party. There is a progressive force and political party, the Israeli Communist Party, and what have you. Um, could you maybe say something about the, the, the sort of the scale of activity? Of the, the, the Palestinian People's Party and the Israeli Communist Party, and the, the, the extent of their support, and so on and so forth, and what the, the what the perspectives of these two parties is in, in the current situation. Well, uh, John Fox is probably the man to answer those questions. I mean, my understanding certainly is, um, you know, one of the one of the reasons for the rise of Hamas. Obviously, the weakness of Fatah, but certainly, to some extent, the the weakening of the left within the Palestinian movement. I mean, in the seventies, the the organisations you heard about, apart from Fatah, were the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine, the Democratic Front, 
um, which certainly you know they still exist, um, but they're they're a lot weaker. In the early nineteen seventies, these were almost in the vanguard of the Palestinian uh, struggles. Um, they were uh, the ones involved in hijackings and so on, and, and using all sorts of tactics. Uh, but they were certainly a much uh, more vibrant force than they appear to be to be now. So I think there's the left within the Palestinian movement has certainly uh, lost a lot of ground, and, and some of the uh, the more religious based groups have have, um, have come forward. Um, and and you know, maybe John or somebody else can say a bit more about that. Certainly in, in Israel, the um, the Democratic Front for Peace and Equality, Hadash, is, is one of has been the main organizer. I think uh, a lot of the soft Zionist groups, um, like groups around like Peace Now and so on, have not been as active. They haven't been able to mobilize anything like the same numbers. Uh, again, I think it's because of the shift to the right, and also because you have the Labour Party. Um, now, effectively, an alliance, a junior partner of, of the Kud. So there isn't the same cleavage in Israeli politics between left and right, between social democratic uh, left and, and the, the right, that you had maybe even 20 years ago. Uh, so the Labour Party in Israel has undergone enormous um, uh, uh, crises and leadership battles and so on. Uh, and I think that's that's, I think, a factor in the, the weakness of the, the peace movement, that it's been left to the far left, it's been left to uh, the DFPA. Um, but they have very um, uh, powerful spokesmen. I um, think the Knesset member, Dolph, Dolph Kenin, who is a very active and very um, media savvy individual. He's been uh, leading a lot of the demonstrations. Then, of course, they've come under a physical attack from uh, the, the far right in, in Israel, so uh, the situation is is pretty pretty tough for the pro peace and pro equality forces. Um, but um, I'll leave maybe other other remarks can be made about that later. Um, you must have read my mind about Christian Zionism because <laughs> I, actually the first half of what I was going to say was all about the Bible. Yeah. And um, I'll just give you one little bit which I was going to say about this. Because it is very important, I think. It's not just the Jewish lobby within uh, Western Europe or North America that allows Israel to get away with what it's done. There's an underlying um, kind of religious, I can't even call it religious sentiment or knowledge, but it's, it's almost a kind of, it, you know, we use so many phrases from the Bible, David and Goliath struggles and the Good Samaritan, it's almost ingrained in the culture of, of those of us from Western European cultures. And um, just before this crisis happened, Netanyahu had a meeting with the Pope in, in Israel. And this is the Reuters report, this is actually what I was going to open up with. Um, so Netanyahu was meeting with the Pope in May this year. And Netanyahu is pushing this idea of this alliance, this natural affinity between Judaism and Christianity. Historically, of course, not true at all. Um, Islam is actually probably much more um, tolerant of the Jewish religion historically than, than most, and certainly the Catholic Church was. But Netanyahu is playing on this quite deliberately. And one of the things he said was, Jesus was here in this land. He spoke Hebrew, Netanyahu, Netanyahu told Francis at a public meeting in Jer Jerusalem, in which the Israeli leader cited a strong connection between Judaism and Christianity. Aramaic, the Pope interjected. <laughs> he spoke Aramaic, but he knew Hebrew, Netanyahu, shot back. Um, so it's one of those, uh, I, I will make the joke, right? it's Netanyahu trying to be more Catholic than the Pope. Um, but what's very interesting about that is that encapsulates two fundamental myths. One, Jesus, if Jesus existed, I'm an atheist, so I'm not, I'm not going to take a position on his actual existence, but would have spoken Aramaic, not Hebrew. And most Jews in that region would have spoken Aramaic, not Hebrew. And according to the Gospels of Mark and Matthew, which I looked up especially to, to find it, um, the last words of Jesus on the cross <laughs> were in Aramaic. Um, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But the translation is actually given in the King James Bible is in Aramaic. Mm -hmm. And Aramaic is a language which is very closely related to Hebrew and Arabic, from the same family of languages. Still spoken in some parts of uh, Syria by um, Christian churches. 
but not an exclusively Jewish language, spoken by Arabs, spoken by all sorts of people within the Middle East. And one of the great founding myths of Israel was to create a national language, which no Jews actually spoke outside synagogues. There was no Hebrew-speaking uh, Jewish communities in 1947. They were artificially created. They spoke Yiddish, they spoke Ladino, they spoke Russian, they spoke Arabic. Hundreds of thousands spoke Arabic. But here was this attempt to shoehorn a new artificially created Jewish identity into this new state. And it's very, very interesting. And the second point, of course, is Jesus wasn't born in Israel. He was born in Judea, which was one of the many t names given to, um, to that particular part of the world over, over time. It wasn't always Israel. And today, Bethlehem, the reputed site of his birth, is in the occupied West Bank. He'd be a Palestinian citizen. So that kind of, and I was amazed by that story. I, I caught sight of it. The first time I saw it, I thought, this is such an amazing little um, uh, spat between them. Because I think the Pope is actually making a very interesting, important point. It's not, not a theological point at no. all. Uh, but what Netanyahu was doing is what the Israelis have been doing for a very long time, was to try and use this religious sentiment that people have, or even if not religious sentiment, this kind of cultural background based on the Bible, as a means of claiming the territory and a means of claiming um, the, 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 the continued existence of Israel and the continued existence of a, a, a Jewish, an exclusively Jewish claim to the territory. So, um, I wish you'd asked, you'd asked me that question yeah. earlier. Well, again, because it's totally different. Meeting. I mean, I know to be kind of like a theological nerd, which I am. But you know this dispensationalism. I mean, you know, and it, you know, again, they're it's obsessed with Israel. And then at the end of time, you know, there's this great epic battle where the the kind of Christians and Jews kind of, but there'll be Christians like you know, uh, will be fighting the evil forces. Which you know, well, obviously in the eighties, you know, everyone was seeing the Soviet Union in the Book of Revelation everywhere. Now everyone sees Muslims in it. Uh, in 10 or 15 years' time, everyone will see the Chinese in the Book of Revelation. And somehow this dispensational, uh, you know, the guys that are going to be fighting just always seems to chime in with American foreign policy. It's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> well, the truly frightening thing, of course, is that the reason that the Christian right are supportive of it is mm. because they believe it's the fulfilment of the biblical yeah, prophecy yeah, of exactly. Armageddon. Yes, exactly. And they yeah. believe you know, that this conflict is, 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 is biblical prophecy. Mm -hmm. So the more tension there is, the more likelihood of a war, yeah. uh, the better it is. Well, that's the case if, if I was a, an American, if I was a Jewish American, I would be concerned about my family or mm -hmm. my relatives or my whoever, and friends in, in Israel. Um, I would be a little bit worried about all these Christian Zionists going, wait, I'm again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, but that, that is a very powerful mm -hmm. um, point. And I think we had this discussion at another meeting. If I, yeah. Um, but the, the, the Christian right in the, in the United States is very powerful because it's so widespread, whereas the Jewish vote in the United States is, one, very geographically limited. It's essentially it's two states, New York and New Jersey, to some extent in Florida, because it's a swing state, yeah. and California not so much. But also, the, the Jewish vote is Democrat. 80, 80 to 85 percent of American Jews mm. vote for one party and have done consistently. So it's not as if there's a, there's a constituency there that people can, can win over by taking a hard That's why the Republicans, who don't have that many Jewish uh, voters, um, but do have a lot of Christian fundamentalist voters, uh, have taken pretty much the same line as, uh, as, as the Zionists. Yeah. Okay, I'm just thinking about time here. So uh, John, why don't you I'll ask a few points, uh, Teresa? Um, yeah, it's just on the, I mean, there's a couple of um, hopeful points, I think, about the Christian right, hopefully, are going to be sidelined quite soon, because now that the, the uh, democratic vote of the, um, from the Hispanic and incoming populations in America are growing, they're not going to be quite so important. But, um, there's also, I mean, very, like, a lot of the stuff has been getting from the Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, there's now the international 
Jewish anti-Zionist organisation, which actually issued a very, very powerful statement, I think it was last week, um, are really speaking out to try and uh, counterbalance the, the Zionist voice and to, to point out the, the wrongness of a lot of the, the, um, the Zionist propaganda. But uh, yeah, I met some of these Christian Zionists and when you try and point out what's going on and they're telling you that they, they but it has to happen for the, the Messiah, the second coming of the Messiah to happen. And if God didn't want it to happen, he'd, uh, he'd stop it. Um, and one of the folk I was with quite a sort of suggested to the person that if we brought along a baseball bat and started battering over them over the head, would it be okay because God didn't stop us from doing it? You know, and it shut them up a bit, but it was kind of... It's a very, very illogical, very strange perspective these people have. Um, but yeah, there's, there are, uh, I mean, the international, um, the international Jews against Zionism organisation. I think they're going, they're growing. They're going to be pretty powerful. Uh, there's one, one of their guys is actually going across the Gaza with me. Uh, the end of this month, hopefully, Dan from East London. But they're all representatives of uh, families of Holocaust survivors and stuff speaking out and saying that what, what Zionism is is a complete insult to the, the Holocaust victims and the Holocaust survivors. To, um, but there's a very, very good uh, uh, sort of documentary film that an Israeli guy made. It's called Defamation. And I would recommend if anybody could get hold of it to watch it, but it goes into the, the psychology and the way that the Israeli population are kind of controlled by the psychologies of Zionism and um, the, the Holocaust and anti-Semitism and the fear and how, how the control really happens and how, how valid basically a lot of the claims are. And it's, it's a very well made film by a young Israeli filmmaker. Definition. Thanks, Teresa. Anything else, Kenneth? Nope. <laughs> okay. Thank you all very much for coming, and uh, we put our hands together for Teresa and Kenny. All right.